In this lecture, we're going to outline the principles of economic thinking. And these principles are going to help us as we deal with the content of this course. Um, these principles are overarching principles that we'll be able to apply to each and every unit that we work through. And these principles are also going to be used to help us unpack several economic enigmas that we will deal with throughout the course, uh, both um, in the Freakonomics readings and just in the other work that we do. So here we go. The first principle is that everything has a cost. And usually this cost is not a monetary cost. Um, but as economists, we have to think about some of those non-monetary costs. And economists do strive to put a dollar value on those costs. But we have to always think about the, the costs that we incur that have nothing to do with money. So, for example, going to college. Let's say that tuition and room and board and your other explicit costs were $25,000 a year. But you also have to think, if you're an economist, you also have to think about the fact that you're not working for that year. So an economist would say that your cost is $25,000 a year of tuition they have to pay out of pocket. And if you sacrifice earning $25,000 working full time for that year, then your true cost of going to college for the year would be $50,000. So just because there's not a monetary cost to something doesn't mean there's not a cost. Number two, people choose for good reasons. Every time a person makes a choice, they have a good reason for making that choice. They have weighed the pros and cons, and even if you don't agree with someone's choice, their choice was made for a good reason to them. All right, for example, in general, most of us would say it's not a good idea to skip school or to be truant from school. Um, most of us would probably not skip school for a whole day just to get an extra hour of sleep. But I'm guessing that there are a few of you who have possibly called in sick when you had an English paper that you forgot to finish or a big test the next day that you're just not quite ready for. So, you know, in that case, you may have weighed your pros and cons and decided it was worth missing school for the day um, to get out of something that you needed to do that day in school. Uh, so, again, we choose for good reasons. I might not agree with your choice. You might not agree with my choice, but my choice makes sense to me and your choice makes sense to you. Because people make decisions rationally, incentives matter. Um, incentives are what drive human behavior. So let's think about some incentives that exist in the world. Um, for example, if there were no grades, you wouldn't study for a physics test or an economics test or try very hard in school for that matter in any of your classes. So grades are an incentive to get you to study, to get you to graduate. Um, the incentives that exist to get people to follow traffic laws would be you don't want to get a speeding ticket. So that's an example of a negative incentive. You don't want something to happen, therefore you will act in a certain way. People want to save money on gas or save the environment or be able to use the carpool lane and get to work faster. So they will carpool. Um, the incentives that exist to, to get you to be on time to your job would be you want to keep your job. You want to keep earning money. So you want to perform well. And businesses sell quality goods not because they truly care about you and want you to have a good quality good, but they want you to continue to buy products from their company. So they want to keep you as a customer and keep you coming back. So again, there are economic incentives in the world. There are moral incentives. Um, there are positive incentives, things, you know, things that you do because you want something to happen. And there are negative incentives, things that you do because you don't want something to happen. Um, there are all types of incentives in the world. And these incentives are truly what drive human behavior. So if you want to change someone's behavior, you have to change the incentives to get someone to change what they're doing. All right, number four is people create economic systems to influence choices and incentives. Economic systems um, are the systems that societies set up to decide what they're going to produce, how they're going to produce it, and how they're going to distribute the goods that they produce. 
So these economic systems are going to um, set up the systems um, for a society that will outline the types of incentives that are that are there for the people in the society. For example, if you live in a communist or command economy where you're assigned to a job and you don't get paid unless you meet your quota, then your incentive to work hard is to meet your quota, but once you meet your quota there's no incentive to continue working harder. Um, if you work in a market economy and you're an entrepreneur and the more you produce and the more you sell, the more money you make, then the incentive for you is to continue to work hard and continue to make more money. Number five is people gain from voluntary trade. Okay, People make decisions rationally. Incentives are what drive people to make decisions for one reason or for another reason. Um, and so therefore people aren't going to make decisions or engage in a trade of sorts unless they feel that they are winning. And that's all that this principle means. Uh, for example, this individual who is working at the drive-thru at Mr. Smiley's feels that he is winning here. Okay, He showed up to work and he is selling food from the drive-thru window for minimum wage. So he feels like he's winning because he's leaving with a paycheck. Uh, Mr. Smiley, or whoever owns this company, feels that he is winning because he got this guy to dress up and wear this outfit and, you know, stand in the window and say, thanks for shopping at Mr. Smiley's for seven fifteen or seven fifty an hour. So both Mr. Smiley wins and this guy working at Mr. Smiley's wins. Um, people don't engage in a trade or don't, won't act in a certain way unless they feel that they are winning. Number six, economic thinking is marginal thinking. This is perhaps um, the principle that we'll come to, come back to the most often throughout this course as we study microeconomics. And um, marginal analysis just has to do with incremental thinking. So why are there more members of a band than teachers in a classroom? Because the marginal benefit of adding an additional teacher to the classroom could be minimal, whereas adding a guitarist to the band is kind of a big deal. Having a band without a guitarist would would not be a good thing. So the additional benefit of adding a guitarist and then adding a drummer and then adding a bass player to a band is huge and you need those members. So the additional cost is less than the additional benefit. Whereas adding another teacher to a classroom, the additional benefit may not be greater than the additional cost and that's why typically there's only one teacher in a, in a classroom in a school. So you have to think about what, what one additional person can do or what one additional unit of, of a thing that you're trying to decide on is going to do. And if the additional costs are less than the additional benefits, then you will go ahead and add that one additional thing or do that one additional unit of a thing. But if the additional benefits are less than the additional costs, then you're not going to do it. Number seven, the value of a good or service is affected by people's choices. So this one just has to do with prices and the supply and demand model in a market economy, and we'll get into that in Unit 2. But what factors influence your decision to buy a good? What usually happens when consumers do not want to buy a good? Well, I think the answer to that is obvious. The price will drop. Um, and number eight, economic actions create secondary effects. The example that your book uses for this is rent controls. Um, rent controls lower prices of housing for needy families and as a result, because the prices are lower, it's less profitable to maintain the apartments for the landlords of those apartments. Therefore, those apartments that are available at those rent controlled prices are going to um, kind of go downhill. They're not going to be maintained as effectively and as properly and at the same time we're going to end up with a shortage of apartments for rent because at that artificially low price, there's going to be a, a much larger quantity demanded than there will be quantity supplied. And so we're going to end up with a shortage. Um, so for every action that occurs, there will be secondary effects. Related markets will be affected. Um, actions in the future will be affected by, by those current um, decisions and current actions. All right, so these are the eight principles of economic thinking that we will be working with in class and coming back to throughout the term. 
and that's it.